going old school with the Verizon and ad. Can you hear me now? Anyway, so thank you to those of you who have popped on and help us work out some bugs of the broadcast last week. We should be able to have everything running and moving and grooving. Thanks for everyone who showed up early. We love ch chatting with you, talking about where you're from. Um, I think we have Paula and Stacy and Cosmic Splice and Highest Sweets. Cosmic and Splice? Cosmos. Oh, Cosmic Slice. Oh, it's I not a splice. Sorry. It's a slice. I, okay, so I'm like <laughs> Doc from the Seven Dwarfs. I butcher words. <laughs> That's just my thing. Um, we had a, a number of people who are joining for our first time. So if you're joining for the first time, just type first timer in the comments below and all of our regulars will shower you with tons and tons and tons of love. And if you just join, then tomorrow is a, is it a deep dive. DNA, DNA deep dive it for is. members only. So, and you've already sent me the stuff for that, right? Um, I thought you were supposed to be looking for it this week. I thought you said you were sending me this stuff so I could look at it. We'll work it out. <laughs> but if you haven't sent in this, a DNA deep dive, then be sure to send us a DNA deep dive question at info at familyhistoryfanatics.com. The DNA deep dive questions responses take a little bit longer than a typical DNA session uh, or Q&A session rather. And so uh, make sure you send them in. Otherwise, Stacy just can't wait for Andy re to revisit her case. And we might have to pull that up. So um, that is for tomorrow for our channel members. If you want to become a channel member, then what you have to do is click the join button, which is right next to the subscribe button and join for $2.99 a month. And then you'll get all the cool emojis. If you are a channel member, it is time to drop some emojis, your favorite emojis, so that everybody can see the fun ones we can use during the live stream. So howdy. Um, I've already said howdy. Let's get started. <laughs> So um, Andy's going to be running the comments over here. He's probably going to knee me or poke me in the ribs when I need to shut up. And he needs Just when to you see her do something. that, you know that I'm poking her. Um, so maybe he can do some commentary. And I will try to look at comments every now and then, but interject as we go along. But today we're going to talk about genealogy sources. And genealogy sources are the foundation of genealogy research. Um, genealogy depends on the evidence we find and, and we find those evidences in sources. Sorry, I just had a blank spot. <laughs> uh, my brain sometimes goes, um, uh, just, just psh, when I go live, go figure. So that's why I really like to have pre-recorded videos. Um, anyway, so if you agree that genealogy is based on evidence, go ahead and type evidence in the chat right now. Um, but I have selected four questions that have come in from our viewers through the comment sections, through the email, and over on our blog, which is familyhistoryfanatics.com. And we're going to tackle those, but you can always put a question in the chat. Make sure you put a cue in front of it so Andy knows that you're asking a question because we do have a community where people like to respond back and forth to you. So we want your questions to stand out. All right. So the first question was asked and it said, why do some websites have multiple copies of the same source? So I'm got, I've got to switch something really quickly, but what do you think is why some, some, uh -oh, you moved it over. I did. I know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> why have you seen multiple copies of the same source on a website before? Always on Family Search. Almost always on Family Search. Well, I mean, I think you probably see it on Ancestry too, but I just don't look on Ancestry trees that much. So. Okay. So a lot of times this will show up on Family Search, but occasionally it will be on Ancestry because they will have multiple variations of the same type of database. And sometimes your ancestor is going to be in one database and not the other. But I do have some examples here on Family Search, and I have to scroll down to where it was. So um, here we have three sources related to Emery Barris, who is the father of Oren Eliezer. Eliezer. Um, his name is spelled multiple times, so I'm not entirely sure how to say the All name. All three of those are spelled different ways. Uh huh. They are. 
So one of the things we always need to remember if you're a newbie is spelling is fluid. <laughs> but yes, it's spelled three different ways and they're all related to death. And so we'll take a look at the first one. So the first one is an, we have an index. So this helps us get into the actual record because this image isn't searchable. And so we have this database of information extracted out of it. And so there is the actual image you can look at. So that's the first version. The second version comes from a different source. And let me zoom in so you can see these. These are, um, if I remember correctly, burial index cards. So yeah, where is he? He's down here. Alphabetical, yes. So this is a burial record card. So although it looks like it's the same death record, it's not, it's slightly different. And um, now this record supports anything you would find over on Find a Grave, or if you actually visited that rec a cemetery, they would have the stone. And if you went to their office, they would have this card. Just as a side note, mm -hmm. Holda is really not a popular name much anymore. I have never met a single Holda in my life. Holda? Holda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And how many Orins and Eliezer's and Emery's, you, you know, now uh, Emery has become a female name. Yes, that's true. There are a lot of female Emery's, but not so many um, male Emery's. So back to the point where sometimes it looks like it's the same type of source, but it isn't. This is the source that I wanted to show you that's very similar. So the information is very similar to this first one. And you think, well, I've got the image up here. I don't need the second one. Well, let me explain a little bit of what happened. Um, let me go. Uh, do I want this one? Yeah, let me explain what happened. So what happens is Ancestry had this thing called the IGI files from back back, way back before computer technology of sharing everything through the internet and the World Wide Web. If you've used the IGI, go ahead and put IGI in the chat or the comment section. Let's see who actually knows what that means. If you don't, it is okay. Newbies tend not to know what the IGI file is. But what happened in 2012 is Aunt Family Search took the IGI database and dumped it into the family tree and the sources were connected to people. As you started merging people together, you may have this Emery in a record for himself and his son, himself and another child, his self and his wife, his self, himself, <laughs> my grammar is going. Um, but then it, it could be there multiple times. And as you smush everybody together, you've got this one master file. What uh, family search has done recently is some of those IGI records were related to an actual uh, record, like a church record or a marriage record. And some of them were used to submitted trees. When it was a record, they give you this new little prompt and it, it's hard to read on your screen. And it says, this record came from this set of images. Go ahead and browse the film. And then you can go through and actually start browsing for the record. However, some people or some index collections actually have that image. And so that's what you have right here. And if I zoom out, it'll be side by side like it was before. So the question becomes, should you keep all versions? Well, I would recommend you do because otherwise you're going to have to do one of two things. The first thing you're going to have to do is tell family search that that record is not a match. And that's going to actually make a mess up the algorithm because it really was a match. It was a record that applies to this person and you're feeding the algorithm false information and they're not going to be able to keep everything straight. Uh, so I would just leave it. It's not really harming everything. Now, if you want to download your tree and just have one entry in your database, or if you want to go over to WikiTree and you want to put in a source there and you just want to use the actual image one rather than the, the, the one that had that blue box prompt, that's fine too. So there are a number of reasons why it's in there multiple um, times. But what kind of comments and questions are people asking about the multiplicity of documents? Nothing about the multiplicity of documents. Okay. What questions do they have then? Well, um, who was it? Somebody. 
Oh. Tiffany, no clue what the IGI is. Now you mentioned it being a database, but what was the IGI from? How did it get created? Okay, fantastic. And somebody said, don't you mean the International Genealogical Index? And that is correct. So in the past, ancestors, I keep saying ancestry, family search, um, they would do two things. One, they would have volunteers look at copies. I mean, I, I used to do this. It was called the extraction project. And they would send you paper copies of a record. And then you would have this other paper where you would um, take that information and fill out the form. And then we did have computers. We did have databases. Um, so somebody in, we would send it all back to Salt Lake and somebody would key in all the information. And then that information would then be put on these CD-ROM drives. And then you would take all these CD-ROMs and you'd send them to family history libraries. And then you could look at that CD-ROM and it took forever because you type in a name and it would say, then go the, get this CD-ROM and you put that in and it would take forever. And then it'd say, no, you need to go like this one and you pull it in. But it was just this master collection of names pulled out of records. So church records, civil records, parish records, those type of things. The other part of it was, if you, if you remember this, help me out. Um, but I do remember that like before 1975, um, the Utah Gene uh, Genealogical Society and the Mormon church asked people to submit their four generation charts. So they'd get these group sheets and they'd fill out who they were related to, when, where, why, and how, as much information as possible. And they would submit it in. And if some of those got put into this IGI file as well. So it's based on user submitted content as well as people looking at documents. And then that's where they had um, this database. And then they just took that database and shoved it as part of this tree building foundation in 2012. And a lot of times when you see your relative in the family search family tree multiple times, well, it's really because it's based on some of these other databases. And I have videos about merging and I do have more videos about IGI index on Family History Fanatics channel. Be sure to check that out. Yes, and before CDs, as uh, Paula pointed out, it was on Microfish. Oh, that's really old school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the IGI has been around, I think, since the 50s or 60s is when it started, somewhere around there. So, yeah, it predated having computers before CDs were even thought of. True. There was just Microfish. True. There's probably a paper copy of it somewhere, too. I, I bet you if you went to the library in Salt Lake City, you could probably get a paper copy of the IGI to, <laughs> you know, thumb through thousands of pages if you wanted to. But could I say why would you do that? I mean, it's all on Family Search Online. and I Now it is. I can look at it from my pajamas at home at 3 a.m. Exactly. All right. So that was the first question. And I thought that was a great question. If you have any follow up questions, be sure to bring them, um, send them my way. I need to switch something really quickly uh, back here so we can get to the next question. There we go. <laughs> All right. So that was that question. Why do some sites have multiple, multiple copies of the same source? And what should I do with that? Okay. So the next one, this is for you guys in the chat and who are watching the replay. What is your favorite genealogy source? So while you're typing that, I'm going to tackle the next question and then we'll come back to this question. I was about to type it, but you have the question on the screen. I do have the question on the screen and I have a nose itch. <laughs> we always have these nose itches when we go live. All right. But in the meantime, the next question is when I find a record hint or source, what do I need to know? And that is actually a pretty awesome question. Um, what do you need to know? Andy, what do you need to know when you see a record hint? When I see a record hint, what do I need to know? Mm -hmm. um, where that hint came from? Okay. Um, what information might be extra on the hint that the hint's not showing me? Mm -hmm. um, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to do this. There we go. <laughs> All right. So there are a number of things that we're going to want to know um, when we get a record hint. So let me go. You just me. covered up your thing. I did, but I wanted to hide it because I wanted to go here. Get rid You're of You're making it look like this isn't a very professional operation. Like we're doing this out of the back room of our house or something. 
Well, eventually I could probably <laughs> figure this all out, but anyway. All right. So let's see. We have Lucille Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. That's I think you spelled Pfeiffer wrong. I think it's E I. Yeah, I spell things wrong. E I F F E R. Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. There we go. All right. And no, oh, there's only one F. No, I guess there's two Fs. Sometimes. It depends. It depends. All right. So let's say we get to um, a hint or we do a search result. That could also be considered a hint. Let's view at this record. Okay. So now we're looking at the record. And this is for Nebraska marriage indexing. We can go ahead. Thankfully, on this record collection, uh, Ancestry has the image of the index. So when you get to this, what do you do? Are you done? Do you have your answer? It says name, given no, name. No, I'm just sorry. I, I was just like uh, looking at actually how this is organized. Uh -huh. It's organized by the first letter of the surname. Mm -hmm. And then it's organized by the given name. That's correct. Which is just like, why wouldn't you organize it by the name, the surname completely uh -huh. and then the other name, but you know. <laughs> That is actually a more advanced topic with these searches is a lot of times when you get into the indexes, you have to go through and try to figure out how the dumb, dang thing is organized. Um, I found a resource when, it, especially in grantor and grantee indexes, um, there are, let's say, first you need to find the first letter of the last name. Then you need to go to the second letter of the last name and things are clustered together. And then you have to cross tabulate it with the first name of something else. It's uh, There's actually a name for it. And of course, now that you want, you're bringing it up. I can't remember <laughs> the name of it, but I do have it written down in my notes because it was a video I thought I might do in the future. But anyway, you have to look through that and then you go through. It's not alphabetical. They came up with all these crazy systems and blah. Anyway. So one of the first things you should do is actually figure out how something's organized, regardless of whether it's an index or an actual image. So mm -hmm. that was actually a great thing to point out. Um, Ooh, actually, sorry, just to, to interrupt there. So William brings up, hey, maybe this is the Soundex code for the last name. It could. And that's what it's that's what it's um, organized by. And so then the given name, that's why that's all in alphabetical is because all those just fall into the same Soundex code. And so the given name now is the only name to alphabetize mm -hmm. them. Good That's job, entirely, William. I think you're right there. I think I think because you win. It's it's been a while since I've done Soundex, uh -huh. but going down and looking at this list right here, I think every single one of these names would have the exact same Soundex code. Mm -hmm. Now the one I was mentioning isn't a Soundex. I know um, because it told you the first letter, then the next letter, and then this letter, and then you triangulate it, and then it gives you a page number, and that's how you go. So it's not sound X, but I think you're right with that one. Good call. All right. So the next thing. So we've got the name. In some cases, we have who the spouse is. We have the certificate number with the county year. We're done, right? Absolutely. What do you guys think? Are we done? Do we have our answer of when people married? Well, no. The whole point of it is this was an index. And because it's an index, I'm going back. Um, what we want to do is figure out, whoo, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> we want to figure out what the document was based. This collection um, reports images from the state wild comp compiled marriage index from the state of Nebraska. I really love when the um, descriptions on family search or ancestry or my heritage, they tell you like exactly what record to go to next um, because you know, sometimes you're like, uh, I don't know what collection to look at and um, help me out here. But uh, they'll say, oh, this is based on this collection. Go look this up in this archive and you're good to go. But since it's a marriage index, you have a lot of information. Now you can go to the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services and you have a certificate number. You have a, a name and you have a, a year. So then you should be able to order the actual image. The other thing I would do is sometimes the source, the index is on one website and the images are on others. So then I would go do a search, Vital Records Nebraska, or in this case, Marriage Nebraska, Records Nebraska, 
and then see if you can actually find those images online at another place. But you've looked at the index and you know what you're looking for. So those are some of the things that I would go ahead and um, explore. Now I'll show you this next way. If you have a record hint, um, here's another example of a New York index. New York is notorious for not giving you a lot of their um, information. They protect them, but thank you to reclaim the records, I think it's called. They go and have found a lot of the indexes and made them free on various websites. But here's an actual version of the marriage index license that Ancestry has. And there you would go through and do go try to request the actual image. But here's another one. And I go here and I have, this is from the U.S. Presbyterian Church. This is from the Brick Presbyterian Church in, uh, I think it's New York City. Are we done when we get to something like this? Yes. Why? I don't know. I was just saying yes. <laughs> Probably because the answer is wrong. You, well, it could be right. So we're looking for a marriage date. We've come to a church record and we're looking at this document. Have we found an original source? Have we found the answer to our questions of when two people married? No? No. 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 Because <laughs> if you look at the dates in the uh, left-hand column there, they're jumping all over the place. So okay. This is a index that was made after the fact. Um, some of them are seen in order. It is possible that, that some got left off and then they reinserted it, but I'm seeing 22, 23, 23, 25, 26, okay, maybe 27. I think they're in order. Okay. What did they say? <laughs> It could be a copy book that was um, handwritten. Absolutely, it could be a copy. Um, I know in Catholic or in the Paris records, excuse me, and um, you were talking about this when we were in Bernie, that there are two copies. You mm -hmm. want to explain that a little bit for English parish records? Yeah, for English parish records, what they did is, is they uh, were required to send a copy of the records to the bishop at the end of the year. And so each parish, of course, did this slightly differently. And so some would just copy exactly. And so the two formats would look the exact same. Sometimes what they would do is they would, you know, as things happen, maybe things got out of order because people were baptized and not recorded at the right time. And so they went and put them in anyway. And so in the bishop's copy, they might have reordered it. Sometimes they would alphabetize it or something like that. I mm -hmm. mean, there's, it was all up to the clerks as far as what they were going to do. But in the end, you had two copies of these records. Yeah. So um, one of the things that we can pay attention to when we come to these documents is that, um, I was trying to see real quick. We are at the original record for the Presbyterian church. Now it's possible they may have church minute books. They may have programs. You never know. Go ahead and ask, hey, I see in this collection that you have um, this entry. Do you have any other additional records? Do you have newsletters from that time period? Do you have the annual church yearbook, if you will? You can ask to see if there's anything else. You never know. There might be. But as far as searching to the original record, you've moved past the index. You're now at this particular in, uh, original record and you're good to go. But does that mean you should stop searching for more information about the relative's marriage? As people have said in the comments, not necessarily. You should want you want to look at newspapers. You want to look at anything in people's home sources. You want to see if they have that marriage license and actually look at it because each record may give you a little bit different information. So I think when it comes to records, a lot of people will get hung up about classifying the record. And if you want to learn how to classify a record, there's a link to a better flow chart on how to do that. It's in the description. But what I'm trying to emphasize is do your best to get past that original index page to an original image upon which that index or the extraction in the database is based on. But then don't stop there. Look to see if you have additional records to support that one record. Okay. 
All right. So can we go back to the question of the day where I asked, what are your favorite genealogy sources? Did people answer that question? There was a few. There were a few. Awesome. You're making me go back now. I am making you go back. Um, somebody said genealogy bank. Oh, that's a great place to go and look for other records. Um, and a good resource of records for sure. Vital documents. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tasmanian birth, death, and marriage records. Oh, I did see some records in the free ancestry collections. I just talked about them in a video that I'm doing releasing soon. So there are free Tasmanian records over on ancestry. That's it. Awesome. Okay. So if you have a favorite genealogy source that you haven't seen go up on the um, chat, go ahead and include that now. Um, what is your favorite genea favorite genealogy resource? I don't have one. You don't? No. Mine are city directories. I know. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Did everybody say that already? No, because you didn't ask them what yours was. But everybody knows that that's what your favorite is. <laughs> yeah, those are my favorite. And they're in my favorite because I can track people year by year. And I can see the minor changes. And I found so many wonderful stories by paying attention to those little details. My next favorite is starting to be land records. I like that I've, <laughs> I've found a relative who... Um, deeded their pew in a church to someone. And I thought that was just crazy. I mean, it tells you a lot about the time and place that they put it in the, ch the church property records that they're passing on the land records. What the other thing I like about land records is you can find females there. Now, it may not always be your female, <laughs> but you can find a lot of females in land records. Either they're in the the deed below who the buyer and the seller were, but they're giving a, you know, they're saying selling their dower rights or or signing off on them, or they inherited property and all the heirs have to say it's okay to sell this property. But there's also women, like they are buying the property. They are selling the property. And that just blows my mind um, because I've been told a lot of falsehoods about women and what they couldn't, couldn't do in the past. And depending on where you're researching, you may find a lot of great things. So, all right. I gave you guys enough time on the question of the day. We're going to go to my next question that I, I had brought up. Oh, here's my second question of the day. Oh, I thought you said there was only one question. There is just another one. I forgot. I'm sorry. Forgive me. This isn't the super professional show where we have somebody else running and we just <laughs> chat, you know. Anyway, <laughs> so my next question. You don't have it misspelled, by the way. I don't? Yeah. I I, I spelled it right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Why do you do this to me? <laughs> because I'm panicking thinking I have a spelling error. That's not fair. I just said you didn't spell it wrong. <laughs> but then I'm like, I spelled something wrong for sure. Or you wouldn't have said that. Nope. Anyway, all right. So tell me what's the most difficult you the win. record that you guys search in? Which ones either they're harder to access, they're harder to read, or they're harder to understand. So tell me what the most difficult record you have. What are some of the most difficult? And not ones that don't exist. That's cheating. <laughs> well, my the ones I think that are the most difficult are DNA results. <laughs> you can't say the 1890 census. Well, you can if you have one of the 6,920 names. I, I, I know it's not have that. Have you specific. met anybody yet that has one of them? I haven't. But you know what? When I just have no, you know, no kids at home and you're not bugging me, someday I might just go get those 6,900 and however many names. I might be overstating by a couple hundred. And I think I'm going to go I link them to everybody in their family. That, you know, that would be a good thing. If there's one thing that you can say that, hey, the 1890s census is all completely linked in family search or ancestry, or whatever, because then it's only 6,000 names. So, all right. Some people have contributed. So, Rana, hey, Rana, glad you're here. She said old English records from 1600s. Yeah, that, that's hard. Um, so I know a lot of Germans, especially people who are reading German as a second language. Uh, I forgot the year that they changed their um, written German, Germanic language. But I have a friend of mine who's like, oh, I can't read that. That's old German. <laughs> and he grew up in Germany. I mean, he is German. Like, he doesn't get any more German than that. He's like, no, I can't read that. 
So Tiffany says any California records because they hold them tight, even when related to people. That's now. About 15 years ago, they didn't. Oh, really? Yes. Like at one point, I'm not sure if it was just all birth certificates were online or all marriage or all of everything, mm -hmm. but it was all online and I'd heard about this. And so since I was born in California, I decided, huh, let me go and see. Sure enough, there was my birth certificate right there online. And I'm not like 120 years old either. Yeah. I may look like I'm 120 years old, but I'm not. <laughs> you look good for 120. <laughs> um, Colorado is hard too. I found that researching Colorado, it's hard because one, they don't have a lot of records because they're a fairly recent state. New Mexico has that problem, but they have something that um, oh, compensates for the lack of a lot of records. Um, Colorado has that problem, but, but then there just wasn't a lot of people in Colorado for a long time. Um, New Mexico compensated because of their uh, Catholic church records, because they name typically the priest will name the child and specify the maternal and paternal uh, parent, obviously. And then the maternal and paternal grandparents. It's awesome. All right. So we have from Paula, uh, we'll just call it drunken chicken dancing. <laughs> I, I think that's, you know, that's an apt description of it. Oh, you know, which records are even, I, that reminds me. So I was looking at some, um, some Spanish Catholic church records in New Mexico and the handwriting was chicken scratch, but the front and the back pages bleed together. So it's hard to tell which page you're looking at. So that's the time. You so just you have got to the go. samba on one side <laughs> and the tango, and on, the the tango on the back. And <laughs> absolutely. Those are really, really hard to read. <laughs> All right. So let's go to the next um, thing. How do I link one record to multiple persons? So we'll go ahead and do a little training on this. And um, this was a common question. This was sent in to us by our email newsletter participant. Um, so if you're on Ancestry, I need to make it so that you can actually see. Give me a second. I haven't figured out how to swap between. The... They're going to see you swapping on the corner up there. That's all right. Okay, I'm in the this one. And then you take off the program. Oh. Mm -hmm. See, they see you moving around. Okay. <laughs> I'm in this one. And let's just go here. Okay. Nope, that's that one. How do I get out of the slides and get over well, to you? Gotta... Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I do that. Yeah, normally you do that. You're so much better at it live. Okay, so um, so here is, uh, I'm not showing the hint flow that not everybody enjoys on Ancestry, but let's see, you find this record for Jane Shreve and it has all of the kiddos in it. If you're lucky, this will be a collection where Ancestry will let you link everybody at the same time. So go ahead and say, click yes. And then all you have to do is go through here and connect them to the, the um, people in your tree. So there's Jane. Um, I can click not a new person if I think she's already in there. It doesn't look like she is after all. That's a big old lie. So I'm going to add a new person, add a new person. But there were like multiple people in that household. Uh, so it gets kind of frustrating when you go through that way. So you have to go back and see who was it that was in this household. So we've got Clara. She should have shown up. Maribel. Clara she, did show up. Okay. So Maribel didn't. The sister-in-law. Well, that makes sense. And then the lodgers. They're, well, that's probably because Maybell is really the daughter of Clara. Oh, so then you have to click here. That's probably what it is. Because I just don't see Etta having a daughter at 56. <laughs> you know, and I'm not. On diving. the other hand, it might be that James and Etta adopted Maybell. Uh-huh. Okay, so save. Didn't Clara go in the tree? Clara. Yeah, there she is. Okay. Attach. There's the father. I don't know why they make you click it again. You don't necessarily have to. And then we can add the Maybell. You're right. That makes more sense. 
And the lodgers, of course, aren't going to necessarily be in your tree unless you know how they're really related. But that's one way you can do the link the multiple sources. Now, here's in on family search. If you have a record hint, I know it's hard to read, but I just want you to get a rough idea of what's happening. So Mark over here. No, see when I oh I zoomed out. <laughs> Mark on the left is what's on the record. Mark on the right is what's in the tree. And so I can bring his information over. I can complete a reason statement, but then it says other people who are named on the record. And so I can open this up and find if that's the dad and drag and drop it here, go through compare, and then I can go through the process. I don't know if you know, they don't have it here, mm -hmm. but, and this is off topic, but related off topic. Okay. In merging in family search now, mm -hmm. they have pre-filled out reason statements. Yes, for they you do. Mm -hmm. So that you don't necessarily have to try to type all that. Yes. It's great. Sorry. It's great. It is great. And um, I do have a video on updated merging on family search. So that video is available for those who want to see that. But that's basically how you can get multiples. Now, I do have a word of caution and caveat with that. And that is um, if you happen to have famous people on your um, your tree or on your records. So, for instance, I don't know how common this is, but there was a missionary call record for Emory Barris that I showed you earlier. And it said unfinished attachments. And when you looked at the unfinished attachments, um, you'll know this one name. Many of our viewers won't, but I think everybody's going to know the second name. So the first name was George Albert Smith. You recognize that name? And then the second one was J.F. Smith for Joseph F. Smith. Now, this isn't the Joseph Smith, the one who started the church in Nauvoo and Ohio and all of those places in New York. This is one of his descendants. Actually, I think it is one of his brother's sons. Okay, one of his relatives. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did say that wrong. That made, As soon as I said it, I knew I was wrong. But anyway, you've at least heard of those names. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it would be not wise for everyone who has a mission call to have George Albert Smith or Joseph S. Smith to link all these mission papers to that person. Because you're going to have thousands and thousands of them. And I think Family Search limits you to the number of things that you can link to like 99 to mm -hmm. one person. But mm -hmm. then your brother or sister can link 99 to that same person. Mm -hmm. So it, I think there's, there's a limit as far as linking. And I think there's an ultimate limit as far as how many things can be linked. Mm -hmm. So in that, so that's kind of an obvious case. So with that being said, um, they are starting to put the officiator in some of, in, they're starting to index some of the officiators, like on marriage records. Would you link that to the officiator? I wouldn't because more than likely, because I mean, think about this. If you are the pastor of a church for 40 years, which is entirely possible and and probably in some um, religions is very likely. And if your church is just moderately sized, let's say you have a few hundred congregants, you might be having, you know, 15, 20 baptisms a year that you're the officiator for. You might have another 15, 20 marriages each year you being the officiator for. You might have, you know, a bunch of burials being the officiator for. And times that by 40 years and you're talking, you know, maybe into the thousands as far as these documents that you're the officiator for. Yeah. So I'd leave them off because, I mean, granted, it's great that they served in that capacity, but they're going to swamp and overshadow the story of their life and their family members. So um, go ahead if you see them and you can find out where they are online, just make a note. Hey, they were the officiator for blah, whatever, just to ensure that that record says that they were an officiator, but don't attach that source. I On skip the it over. other hand. Or the justice of the peace, the same kind of situation. If uh, the officiator was something like your dad or your grandpa mm -hmm. or something like that, then you probably would want to actually attach that. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. All right. So... Um, were there any questions? There was a question happening in the chat. So did you find any I'll questions? I'll let you know. Okay. Don't worry. That's my job. Okay. I was pausing for questions. It's not, it's totally off. So it's totally off. Okay. So this final question is, 
Um, how reliable are the sources we find in the media galleries on ancestry and for family search? So let me give you a gentleman who has lots and lots and lots. He has 123 sources. He was polygamous, so that helps increase the number of sources. All those kids. <laughs> All of those kids. So we have pictures of, and I'm, I really like this that's happening. Um, if you hover, the names are there. I can't find the zoom in button because of how zoomed in I am. But if you zoom in on this picture, the, the little hover names will start going over them. There's a new little feature on that. But I'm going to get back out to memories. Um, this document. Why don't you go back into it, but zoom out so that you can zoom in. Okay. I will do that. Aha. Okay. So what about this? How would you, so this says, it says, uh, this guy was trained and missionary in the seventies hall and they have just a bunch of little details. And it's added to the memory section, but it doesn't tell you where it's from and what it all means. What would you do if you see something like that in the memory section on Ancestry or any other place? Well, you probably want to try to figure out where it's from so you can add some information because right mm -hmm. now it's just a piece of paper. Now, this is obviously not from that time period of 1840 <laughs> because that paper looks a little bit too new. That type setting is a little bit too modern. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been pulled from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's really the types of information that you want to be able to add in there. Hey, this is from this book or a transcription of such and such a book. Mm -hmm. Another thing you could do is you can send a message to, I'm going to close that out real quick, but you can click on that. It'll pop up a message and you can send a message internally. And if they've shared their email, you can share um, go copy their email and email them directly to say, hey, can you tell me more about this? There wasn't a citation. Where did you get it from? I really would like to follow up on that research. That's another option. Um, sadly, I saw this about a month ago, and of course it changed. Um, but there was a copy of a biography, and it said at the top, um, made available from the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers, I believe that's how you say it. I know it's Daughters of Utah Pioneers, but I'm not sure which order they have everything in there. And um, then it was a copy of a biography. It looked very much like this. Um, but what would you do when it says Emery Barrius Pioneer, and then it's a biography by Esther Warner, June 1954. How would you, what would you do when you come across that source? I'd try to figure out who Esther Warner is. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my gut instinct for a biography is she's probably a relative, but she might not be, uh -huh. she might be a granddaughter or daughter or something like that, but she might not be also. Right. Um, and then some of the things I'd like here is when people add a, um, newspaper clipping. And what I like that they did here is they have the clipping of the, um, the clipping have the clipping of the clipping. <laughs> they have the clipping, but they also have where it's from and when. And so it's not a complete and accurate source citation, but it's enough that I could then go look at that, look at this. But maybe I don't even want to because I'm actually looking at a variation of that document. Any thoughts? Nope. Nope. Okay. So, oh, I don't want that one. <laughs> I almost went back to the countdown timer. Um, those are the questions I wanted to tackle today um, with you guys. What other questions do you have that we can answer regarding sources, um, finding sources, your favorite sources? Um, now is your time for open Q&A. So I was just going to say, Haya Sweets had a question about the family tree in 23andMe. Sure. So we're not going to answer it today because okay. we're going to be doing a video on the family tree and 23andMe. Okay. So Sounds good. That's an upcoming video. Hiya, sweets. Just keep looking for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, raining in Victoria. <laughs> it, I, you know, live, having lived in Vancouver, it rains all the time up there. <laughs> um, Oh, and um, some people will see comments from John and some of our other regulars telling you what they eat for lunch. That's a holdover from some of our premieres. We tend to get together right about the time. Um, well, 
before our current time, it was dinner time in England. And so John would tell me all of the things that he was making. And no, he's not in England. He's in Ireland. <laughs> I know that. But he would tell me the Irish dishes he was making. And then our English viewers would tell me what they were making. And I kept going, I need to get to Ireland, England and try all these wonderful dishes because the other alternative is to make it myself. And I don't make things very well. Um, I butcher half the stuff I make. So he does the cooking and he's not always available. So someday I will go to Ireland and England. And so when they share with me what they're eating, they're making me salivate and want to go. John's having a roast beef for dinner. Oh, that sounds yummy. That sounds yummy. We talked about desserts. We've talked about salads. We've talked about all kinds of things. And so not to be left out, some of our um, people on the East Coast, they'll tell me what they're eating. And some of them are very interesting. Uh, some of them make me go, we Americans are crazy with what we try to eat. <laughs> and some like of them what, are kind of delicious too. What, what What's crazy about East Coast American. Unfortunately, dishes. I can't think of them off the top of my head. I'm I like just get going. Ooh, that's gross. I, that doesn't even sound delicious at all. <laughs> well, like having moved to New Mexico, you're so green chilies uh -huh. or chilies just in general, green or red chilies. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had green or red, green chilies certainly before in lots of our dishes, mm -hmm. but nothing like New Mexican green chilies. Mm -hmm. One in the quantity and two in the heat that they have. Um, they just burn your mouth. They, they burn my mouth like crazy. Uh, okay. So I grew up in Texas and I ate Tex-Mex food all the time. It's one of my favorite meals next to barbecue, but I always, you've got mild cause I like the flavor of the salsa and like the flavor of a little bit of spice, but that's all I need. I do not need to burn my mouth in order to consume my food. If I have to burn my mouth to eat food, then the food probably isn't very good. So then I moved to um, New Mexico and we went out to this Italian New Italian. Mexican fusion and it was really yummy. So if you ever get to Española, go check them out. Um, anyway, so we were going to have green chili on a chicken Alfredo and then there was going to be another pasta that had chipotle sauce. Now, I've had chipotle sauce before, and it burns my mouth in Texas. So I thought, oh, I'll stay away from this. I asked if the chilies were mild, and they're like, yeah, they're mild on the Alfredo. The Alfredo made me cry. It was so hot. <laughs> and then I had the chipotle one, and it was mild. And I'm like, oh, my freak. What have I walked into? <laughs> All right. Well, if there aren't any other further questions during the live show, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up early so that he can work on our floor and then film some more videos. And um, we in tomorrow is the DNA deep dive and <laughs> we'll find the question. I thought you already, already had it. Um, and then in two weeks, I'm going to be traveling. So Andy's going to be tackling DNA all by his little lonesome. Yay. I'm going to go see, see Caleb. Oh, I'm going to go see Caleb. I'm going to celebrate his birthday a week you're later. You're going to be gone in the morning? Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought you were going to be leaving in the afternoon. I might be here. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how fast I want to go hug on my son. Okay. That's, mm -hmm. I guess that's appropriate. Well, you got to figure out when his classes get out because there's no point in showing up early if he's in class. <laughs> well, we can just wander. Okay. <laughs> If you have any other questions, be sure to put them in the comments after this video. I uh, hope that was helpful in answering some of your questions about sources and um, just keep the questions coming. That's how we know what you want to talk about next. We'll see you later. All right. Bye-bye.